So again, shape and form. Um, sort of like line, um, you'll start to see some concepts building on each other, right? So we'll start to talk about figure ground relationships. We'll start to talk about movement. Um, very similar things that we touched on with our last topic, right? <clears throat> so basically a shape is any closed two-dimensional object, essentially. I hate using the term objects. Sometimes we're talking digitally, right? But basically anything that's like a closed shape, right? It's basically flat, meaning it has two dimensions, usually measured by height and width. Um, and basically all shapes are generally derived from basic shapes, squares, triangles, and circles, combos of those to create more complex shapes. Essentially, not all shapes, but basically. There's a few types of shapes. Geometric shapes, which are probably the most familiar, uh, are basic two-dimensional shapes. Um, they can be uh, created or analyzed using mathematics. Um, so squares, octagons, rectangles, triangles, etc. all things that we're relatively familiar with. There's organic shapes, a shape that's uh, essentially um, related to or derived from living matter from nature. So like you can see here in the top right with our water pooling or liquid pooling, whatever that is, um, the way that leaves form. So they don't have to be found in nature, but usually they're sort of like inspired by nature. They're a little bit more naturally created. Um, this is actually a fungus and the way it's growing, all that fun stuff. So we see this stuff come up in nature all the time, right? Um, I was going to talk about something else, but we'll get, we'll get there later. Um, so the types of shapes generally, geometric are angular usually, um, kind of look machine made, organic, uh, biomorphic is another term for that. Um, <clears throat> usually more curvilinear. Um, they're, they can be irregular. They're usually, again, more inspired or derived from nature. And then super shapes, um, linked in various ways to produce larger shapes. Um, it's a whole mess of a sentence. But basically, larger shapes that are made up by a variety of other shapes, right? So again, when we talked about shapes essentially being derived from three general shapes. Um, and then they're, they can all be rectilinear, curvilinear, irregular, Accidental, representational, non-objective, non-representational. Um, basically, the last part, non-objective, non-representational, basically just means they, did, they, they don't have to actually represent something, right? They could just be a shape. You're not drawing a water bottle, per se. So kind of like line, shape has a direction, right? And we can um, drive that direction using scale. So even with some of these regular and irregular shapes here, um, you can see that based on the shape of these, they sort of seemingly have a direction, right? This one, and, and a lot of these two can be, cultural is not the right word, but somewhat cultural, in that some shapes, um, like this sort of has sort of like an arrow-ish shape, so it looks like it's kind of pointing from left to right. Um, it looks like it's sort of got a head and a tail, kind of, so we're kind of familiar with, with that. Um, this is sort of what would be more of an organic shape, but it's similar to this hammer shape, so it's got a little bit more vertical weight, so it might have some movement coming down, specifically like this hammer. Um, most of us are familiar with a hammer, so we kind of can have that, um, that sort of previous knowledge of an object will imply motion, right? So we almost say it since it's already pointed down, you sort of get this implied motion that it has come down from a higher point, right, when you swing a hammer down. Um, and then some of these shapes, again, a little bit more, um, some organic, some geometric, but with the weight at the top here being pointed down to the bottom, it kind of has that left to right, top to bottom motion, etc. cetera, even with, even with sort of more irregular shapes, um, the motion can be, um, can be a little bit more even. It can go left to right, so you get sort of sometimes like not like an undulating motion, but you might get like a, like a back and forth motion, et cetera. So some are a little bit more obvious, some not so much, right? Um, so basically any shape that's longer in one direction than another direction kind of moves in that direction along the axis, right? Axis, that's kind of what I was talking about. So any shape that's longer um, or that moves in the direction of a straight or curved line, 
or curved shape will sort of have movement along that axis. Um, when the shape has substantial projections, those projections will show a movement along another axis. So we talked about that vertical axis. Again, with this vertical axis of this irregular shape, and then also the hammer, and then even going into B with some of these projections, they'll point essentially to those projections. Um, and then uh, shapes that sort of show a general sameness, um, they might not be exactly mirrored, but they might be generally similar. Like these in C, they kind of have a moving in either direction, sometimes back and forth, but sometimes they can, um, they can move you in either direction, right? So putting this into practice, um, we can see with um, some cubist paintings um, on the left are a little bit more easy to see some of these geometric shapes, some of the shapes made to use this, uh, to, some of the shapes used to make this uh, painting, this character, uh, where the one on the right still uses some of these shapes, but a little bit more, um, I was going to say formally, um, as in like using some of the actual natural forms of the shapes. So you can see a huge variety, more geometric shapes in the left, but still creating that movement, creating that vertical and linear movement. And then with the image on the right, you can see some of these shapes. You have this nice sort of dark kind of triangular shape here in the background that points, sort of drives your eye right to left. You know, you have this not quite portion of a spherical shape here that might drive the viewer's eye top to bottom, left to right, right to left. And again, with the shapes, with the drapery here, you know, creating some more angles, creating some more shapes, uh, basically different ways to drive the viewer's eye through the piece, right? Definitions of form. <clears throat> so form is when we start talking about three dimension effectively. So a three dimensional object on a picture plane, three dimensions, it appears to have height, width, Depth is the most important part. Um, forms may be real or implied, um, kind of like our implied lines, right? When we talked about that. Um, I was going to say last class, but last uh, presentation. Um, and again, there's types of forms along with types of shapes. Um, your basic geometrical forms, cones, cylinders, pyramids, cubes, etc., etc. Forms that we're generally relatively familiar with, right? There's a variety of ways to turn shapes into forms, right? Shapes are generally a flat plane, where form is generally a three-dimensional plane. So you can essentially just add simple contour, turning a square into a cube, right? But just by how we have these objects here in a more detailed contour drawing, you can see that there's, like this object is in front of this object, because you can't see through it with playing with the opacities. So even with a simple um, contour line drawing, just by um, ordering the objects, right? This would be like implied form, right? So these shapes are all flat still, right? Like it's a flat drawing, it's a contour drawing, but the shape is implied through how the objects are ordered, right? Through how they're stacked together. Um, and then you have a sort of more, when I talked about real form in the last slide, real versus implied. Um, I mean, they're all effectively implied if we're drawing it, right? Um, but this would be more of an example of like a real form, like you're actually showing depth and you're showing the form through shadow, um, through your line work, through shadow um, and shading. And then either through perspective, right? If we added some more shading to this, this would be a really detailed uh, formal drawing. But with this forced perspective of this water bottle laying on its side, you get an idea of volume, you get an idea of a sense of, of shape, not necessarily size, but a sense of shape, right? So it's, it's effectively a contour. It's kind of a combo of, of these two. It's effectively a contour that you've given some, uh, some depth by adding percep uh, perspective. Um, you've given it depth, right? So more specifically related to our upcoming assignment, um, when we talk about figure ground, right? So this is one of the sort of oversimplified versions of like a figure ground relationship. Um, how many how many shapes are in this image? Five. Hmm? five. Five, yes. And how did you come up with five? 
is, and then just basically just move on. Yes. So there's effectively five shapes. Um, so yeah, there's the four boxes. You have your four dark shapes, and then you have the ground, which is effectively the negative space, the space in between the boxes. It also includes like outside, but also you know you get the idea. Um, but that negative space, that ground relationship, technically counts as like that fifth shape, right? So it's something to always consider. We always need to consider the negative space or the ground figure ground relationship when we're designing. It's getting us to figure ground relationships. Which we'll start working with this assignment. Um, so we have these two examples. Um, it's not necessarily a trick question, but uh, you know, it, it just depends on, on your perception, right? So are these designs black shapes on a white background or white shapes on a black background, right? The answer is yes. Um, it can be either or, right? Since there's no real indication of what's the figure, what's the ground, right? So you can kind of play with this, right? With this sort of like yin-yang bird thing we have going on here sort of zebra stripe thing, right? This could easily be, um, it could easily be black shapes on a white background or white shapes on a black background, right? But all the same kind of relationship, that figure ground relationship, right? Um, so talking about positive and negative space, you'll hear me harp on this all semester, right? It's positive and negative space, figure ground, right? Um, so it basically refers to the relationships of shapes of a figure to a ground on a two-dimensional surface, right? So it's what that relationship is. And again, you can kind of play with that relationship in a design, um, uh, in a design, I guess. There doesn't need to be another word there. Um, so the figure or positive shape is a more definite shape and is generally immediately recognizable as that shape. Um, and then the shapes or areas in between or amongst the figures are the ground or the negative shapes. So even as we have here in our Hope for Peace illustration, we have these two children that are holding hands, running, playing, having a good time. And then in between their bodies and their hands, we have this piece of in the negative space, right? So we have a wing, a wing here, a wing here, a head here, body, and a tail, right? So we have that using that negative space as a design element, right? Um, MC Escher, this is where I was going to go earlier in the, uh, in the discussion. Um, MC Escher does this a lot. He plays around with, uh, takes it to a little bit of another level, um, plays around with like tessellations and things like that. Um, I feel like whether you guys know it or not, you guys have probably seen MC Escher's work like 50 million times. They're like all over the place. They're super pervasive. Um, generally, if you see any kind of work that looks similar to this, nine times out of ten, it's MC Escher. Um, but you can see how he kind of plays around with the figure ground relationship here, where he effectively swaps them. So here we have the figure at the bottom, or if you want to start at the top, by the way, the figure at the bottom is this white illustration of a horse rider on a black background. And then as you can see, he adds in a little bit more detail, takes away some detail, adds more detail in the black, takes away more detail in the white, keeps going with that less detail in the white, more detail in the black, and then it's flipped. So where now the figure is the dark horse rider on a white background, right? In a similar way to this, it's a little bit more abstract, but taking a sort of abstract shape and playing with that figure ground relationship, sort of transforming that shape into the birds as it goes into the top of the image, um, which is this is something that we're going to tackle um, for um, this section's assignment, the sort of transformation positive and negative space, figure ground relationship. Um, this is another version of it where you can see, again, sort of like a combo of the two illustrations we saw before. But we have, you know, taking away detail as we go further up with the fish, adding more detail as we go further up with the birds, and then you have this like literal horizon line kind of in the middle where it starts to change and that figure ground relationship swaps as we change, transform from a white fish to a black bird. And then the classic FedEx logo that I've showed you guys before. Um, the classic FedEx logo with the arrow in the middle of the E and the X, sort of that classic example of using negative space as a design element. Um, and then generally, like for me, when I see this, like I can't, like I can't unsee that now. Like that dove, like I have to automatically like Assume like when I saw the children with the dove thing, whatever, like I, I see it like immediately because I can't unsee it. 
And then sometimes I forget. It's like, oh yeah, it might take somebody like a little bit to, to pick up on something like that. Question, yeah. Like the crown on there too. Which, oh yeah. And there's yeah, there's I'm not sure how purposeful that is. Um, but yeah, there's sort of this crown, this kind of like upside down crown element between the two words, uh, or between the, the letters rather. It could potentially be a crown. Um, I feel like, like it's not, there's definitely like that element there. I feel like, I feel like if it was more purposeful that there would be, I don't know, there would be some more indication that that was more, but that might've been, you know, a nice, a nice accident. What's that? I think it kind of was because of how close the F was put to the E. Mm -hmm. And it kind yep. of starts with the, another arrow right there. Yeah. A little bit, yeah. You get that similar, yep. You get that similar almost start of an arrow shape with a negative space in the F going into the E. Obviously, it's a little bit different because the E curves. But yeah, but I mean, definitely the negative space, the negative space was absolutely considered for sure in this, in this entirety of this logo.